Hello everyone, uh, please welcome Anand today for the session of streamlining end-to-end -end testing automation with Azure Development Ops build and release pipeline. Anand, we are very glad to have you here today. Thank you, Rashi. Uh, hi everyone, good morning. I hope you've had a fantastic first session at uh, Selenium Conference 2024. Today, I will be speaking with you and sharing my experiences of how to streamline your end-to-end -end test automation now, what does this really mean? I would like this to be interactive. I know online is still weird to me, but put in your comments uh, in the chat box, what does streamlining really mean? UI and API, okay? Uh, that is one. Never heard of it before. Excellent, you are in the right session. Good time to talk about it, okay? So we understand end-to-end -end test automation just by the term end-to-end, -end, it's a very complex uh thing right it has it means your application is deployed configured available all systems are connected correctly test data is available for you to be able to start doing your automation this includes though your test is going to approach it from the front end or uh, a layer below the front end by apis but you still want to uh, want your test to cover your full application scope and getting that set up done reliably, getting the tests running reliably, and executing on, ev on every opportunity that you get is a challenging uh, process. I've faced this challenge many times before, and what I want to share with you today is, given a complex ecosystem, what are the solutions I implemented over there to resolve some of the challenges that they face? Okay, so that is what this session is about. We'll talk about techniques, how you can really automate and plug in the gaps to make sure your end-to-end -end test automation adds value. A little bit about me now before I get started. I'm Anand Bagmar. I've been in the quality space now for more than 20 years. Um, I've built many open source tools related with automation. I have done some small contributions on Selenium project as well. I speak in conferences, I write blogs, though I've not done that in a long time. But overall, I've made a lot of mistakes in these past 20 plus years, but I've tried to ensure I don't repeat the same one again and again. I keep learning. I would love to connect with you after this session as well as part of the Hangouts uh, and then take the conversation either on Twitter or LinkedIn as well, no, and keep learning from each other. So let's get back to streamlining. What does that mean? So I said, I encountered a recent situation where it was really complex and difficult to set up end-to-end -end testing. What does that really mean? This particular organization has hundreds of teams. These teams are distributed. It's hybrid way of working. And because it's hybrid way of working and distributed across different locations, even though you might be in office, the network connections, everything might be very different. Network speeds also might be different. It has a lot of inconsistent uh, developer and estate experience. What do we mean by that? There are different types of operating uh, laptops or, or machines that you work on. Mac, Windows, Linux of different versions. And uh, each of these would have different certificates, policies, apply to it, there might be multiple or different types of VPNs that you might need to connect to, to access your applications or the internal resources. The test automation tool set also varies uh, significantly. So for example, and that environment setup is also very tedious. If you're doing end-to-end -end test automation using TestWiz, you're going to need APM, Selenium, and JDK 17. If you're using any other type of tool, it will have their own uh, requirements. Uh, you would also need emulators, simulators set up. You, uh, if you are doing API or API workflow automation, that tool set is going to be different and so on and so forth, right? Different types of test automation has its different tech stack. And that again becomes a challenge, how to get that set up consistently across the different type of uh, devices that we have, the laptops uh, that we work on. There is a very complex path to production, and this is something that is not thought of very often, unfortunately. The path to production is very important because you uh, need to understand how many different internal environments are there, 
how your code is going to go from developer machine all the way up to production. How are you going to manage test data in that? What kind of branches exist? And do you have the appropriate CI pipeline set up to run the tests as relevant in the different stages of your path to production? That itself is very complex. And given that there's so many teams, so many different products, each team, each product can potentially have a different path to production. Last bit uh, in the uh, reality check is the CI execution. Over here, uh, the uh, custom client, uh, the customer uses Azure DevOps and the Azure DevOps agents could be Windows servers or it could be Linux agents. These agents are going to have firewall restrictions, a uh, lot of different network policies applied because they connect to internal environments. And when your tests are running, you need to make sure the correct connectivity is available or, as well. You cannot access the CI agents uh, directly. There's no direct access. If I'm running the test, I can I cannot just log in over there and see what is going on because it's a very complex thing. Uh, and uh, it's for right reasons that access is controlled in a weird way though. There are also multiple node and JDK versions, connectivity issues might be there. And of course, because these are uh, headless agents, there is no uh, browsers or devices connected to these. These agents are shared across by all these other teams that I mentioned about. So that is the ground reality that we have. The path to production that I spoke about, a quick generalization of that path to production, front-end or back-end code, it moves uh, as part of a pull request. It is going to get merged into master eventually. You will run different types of tests over there. Artifacts are generated. Once the artifact is generated, you would deploy that artifact with the right configuration in various different environments and run appropriate types of tests over there to validate if functionality is working correctly before code is released to production. Very generalized version of the complex path to production that exists. In this particular situation, to get your end-to-end -end system tests running or end-to-end -end, uh, tests running consistently is very painful. There are so many different moving pieces uh, all over the place. It is very challenging to have a consistent setup and a consistent deterministic test execution cycle for either the full suite or a subset of tests that you might want to run. These are the challenges that we will be focusing on, and I will share with you what type of solutions are existing for these. Okay, So based on the ground reality, you can sum it up as challenges in terms of ensuring test environment consistency, depending on where the test is running against which environment the test is running, coordinating the test execution, uh, which all means developer should be able to run it, tester should be able to run it, they should be able to run a subset of tests, full suite, uh, anything that is required. It needs coordination in your test framework in a very easy and seamless fashion to make sure that is working correctly. And that's a big challenge. And then, of course, the test execution environment setup and the execution happening in the CI agents itself, how to make that in a seamless fashion. Because without a seamless solution, it is going to be a very manually driven effort how to get this going. So let's look at what are the different solutions that uh, we implemented in this particular situation to get value from automation. The first one I want to talk about is a consistent environment setup. The environment setup uh, is on multi-fold. Uh, you have to think about the basic applications that are required on your uh, uh, device, or on a laptop. So uh, how do you get that happening? Do I have to install each and everything manually, which means if I change my laptop or a new person joins on the team, it's going to take me two, three days just to install everything manually. And it's all configured manually as well. That's a problem. To resolve this, there is a uh, simple uh, brew script that I wrote for Mac, which is going to install all the common applications required. And in less than 15, 20 minutes, you know, most of these are going to be installed and your basic setup is done. A similar script can be written for Linux and probably for Windows as well. But that makes it very easy to get a uh, laptop setup done with basic software as a test authoring environment uh, done very quickly. Second, if you are implementing uh, or you want to run Android tests, you need to have a basic Android SDK, command line tools, and other uh, such 
utility setup on your device. So for the Mac, uh, I have a script that is automate uh, implemented, which is again available on GitHub. So you can simply run this script. It will download the command line tool, set everything, and you have your Android execution environment available uh, on your laptop immediately. So again, in 15, 20 minutes, you can get your Android setup done on Mac very quickly. And this is not just for Android. You can do the same thing for Linux as well. I don't have a script for uh, ready for Windows, but thanks to uh, AI and chat GPT and the likes, you can just take this script and have them create a PowerShell-based script for Windows, which is going to do a similar thing. And within a few minutes, you'll be able to get the script generated, run the script, and your environment is set up. With this approach, you will be able to get your test authoring uh, environment set up done extremely quickly, and it's going to be consistent for everyone. That is the key. It is not just about getting the setup done for one person. It is making sure the same setup, identical setup is done for everyone uh, in the same way. The next thing that you would need to do is uh, you've got all of these installed and set up, but you uh, now need also Node. Uh, if I'm going to run uh, APM, uh, APM2 uh, tests uh, for Android or iOS, I need Node and other such dependencies available as well. So how do I set up uh, those aspects? Sai and Srini, uh, they've already mentioned a couple of different ways how that can be done. They've got a bunch of solutions for that. I have something uh, which is slightly different, but which is also uh, very equally simple to use. And that's a simple package.json that we have where you specify all the dependencies over there and then all you have to do is npm install and you are good to go apm is installed all dependent plugins drivers are installed and you can start running your tests so these are a few of the scripts that are written to do the setup in a very easy fashion and you will be able to start uh, get going on your execution or test implementation site very quickly <clears throat> The next solution that I want to talk about, which is very important for any test automation framework, is how easy is it to run your test, implement and run your tests across various different types of applications or platforms that your application might be supporting. So the criteria that uh, I always keep in mind for any framework is the setup should be extremely simple. And that simplicity is simply by saying git clone or git pull, I get the latest code. And if I do a Gradle build or a Maven uh, setup, whatever the command might be, one command should set up whatever is required for the framework automatically. You don't need anything else to be done or any manual configuration to be done to run the test. Once you have this setup done, no code change required, you'll be able to start running your test directly against any environment based on the configuration parameters in your framework. Now, the way we implemented this uh, at this particular uh, client location is we have this framework uh, called TestWiz, which is a great solution for automating real user scenarios. We'll not get into what that real user scenarios means, but it has a very unique uh, value proposition which not many frameworks or tools will be able to support out of the box. This framework is available, of course, on GitHub. It's open source. And the beauty of this framework is it is command line driven. You will author your test using any IDE, run the test from command line, which can be run against browsers or devices connected to your laptop, or it will run against uh, browsers and Docker containers, or it can point to any of the device farms as well. And the reports will be uh, seen in report portal. Uh, you will get visual coverage uh, using AI uh, from Apply tools, and you also get feature coverage out of the box. It also uses Specmatic for intelligent stubbing as part of running tests in a very different fashion as well. Now, when your tests are able to run from command line, the same thing is going to happen from your CI as well. It's a very consistent way of running your tests. And uh, there's predictability, there's determinism in this way of running. And that's what TestWiz is able to provide to you to run these tests across all different types of browsers or Android, iOS apps, Windows desktop apps, Electron applications as well. As I mentioned, the unique capabilities over here uh, from TestWiz are about automating the real user scenarios across multiple users, multiple devices, multiple apps as well. And another very key aspect is TestWiz supports setting up a hard gate for your functional end-to-end -end tests. We'll talk more about that in a little bit as we proceed in the session. 
So the unique capabilities uh, over here also include all the device farm integration, Aptitudes AI for validations. You get comprehensive reports with trend analysis, feature coverage uh, using report portal. Uh, it's command line uh, interface and it is highly configurable. There are a lot of defaults which you can override by providing in property files, which can also be overridden from environment variables. What this means is anyone who wants to run the test just does a get pull, Gradle build uh, or Gradle run. And based on the configurations provided, it is going to start running the test automatically. There's no manual change required in the framework, in the data, in the environment configuration, once it has been specified in the correct way. The next solution is now you have, uh, we'll talk about CI execution. We spoke about your environment setup, test authoring environment setup and how you automate your tests. I showed you one example of how TestWiz does it. Uh, any automation tool, as long as it meets those criteria, it will work in your CI as well out of the box. But to run in CI, it poses many more different challenges than before. The first thing is about potentially a node setup. Because it's a common CI infrastructure, different teams might need different versions of node. How do you select the correct version of node at runtime in your pipeline without hard coding anything? The simple approach that I have uh, created for this is implemented a lot of shell scripts where it is going to detect what type of uh, execution it is. If the shell script is called, that means I'm running in my uh, CI tool. And based on certain logic, it will say, okay, do I need a different configuration for Node as part of running in my uh, CI? Because in CI, I might need to give it uh, different authentication. I might need to set different caching rules. I might need to select a specific version of Node. All of that can be done very easily using the scripting approach. Solution number four. When you're talking about end-to-end -end tests, this means the test could be running against web applications or native applications, Android or iOS or Electron apps. Especially in case of the native applications, you need to download the artifact first before you are able to run the test. Why? Because these artifacts in most cases might have been generated from a different source, from a different pipeline. If these tests are running as part of that pipeline, then the artifact is generated in the same scope and it is available. Excuse me. But if your tests are running as a separate pipeline, as a separate activity, then you first need to fetch the artifact which is generated from the other pipeline. This artifact needs to be available on local machine if your tests are going to run against a local device, for example. Or if you are running the test against a device in the device farm, then you need to upload this artifact to the cloud farm before you are able to run the test. So for this, I implemented a simple script. And to implement this, you need to understand what CI capabilities or what APIs are available in your CI tool. Based on that, you can easily write a script to fetch the latest artifact based on a specific branch, based on whether it's a last successful build or a specific build number as well. Because many times you want to run your test against the artifact from a particular build, not the latest build. Now, when you are able to download this artifact, you will be able to, the script itself can upload the artifact to device farm and make it ready for use in your test framework. Or if you're using TestWiz, TestWiz can automatically upload the local artifact to the device farm and the test can run as part of that. This is a very important piece. Uh, if this is not done, I've seen a lot of uh, teams, unfortunately, they start checking in the artifact in their repository and use that for execution. That's a very bad idea because you should never really be checking in artifacts like uh, APKs or IPAs as part of your uh, source code repository. And second, it is going to keep changing very frequently. So your repo is unnecessarily getting bloated. Binaries, such artifacts do not belong in version control systems. There's a separate system for that. Test code should remain separate. And that's why you downloading the artifact at runtime when required is a very important uh, capability to have. The next solution is proxy handling. Depending on your in environment setup, you might need to use specific proxies for doing certain activities. Certain IPs or domains might be whitelisted. Certain might not be. So you need to understand what is whitelisted or not. And accordingly, 
uh, your framework need you need to be able to provide the right proxy information to the various dependencies in your framework to allow the correct execution to happen. So you might need to set it up at a Gradle or Maven level, at a node level. Uh, this might be required to download the new uh, browser driver versions, for example, or any other external connectivity that might be there. Okay. So the framework now needs to be configurable to say, do I need to use proxy or not? You need to have that kind of capability as well uh, available in your framework so that again, no code changes are required. And then uh, based on where the test is executing from, you will uh, from you'll be able to set up the proxy accordingly if required from there. So here's an example of Azure build pipeline where we have a step in this pipeline to say, update the Gradle properties with the proxy information required. And this Gradle properties file is a simple script that is there again, which is going to be called only in case of a CI execution, uh, Azure execution. When I'm running the test locally, this is not going to be called. So proxy is not going to be applied when I'm running it locally. Okay. So very easy way if you really think about it, how you can do this dynamically without making manual changes on your uh, in your code, in your configuration, just because I'm running locally or in CI. The next one is about downloading dependencies. Your test framework might have a lot of different dependencies, but your CI ecosystem might not allow downloading all of those because those dependencies might potentially come from different sources. So the way I handled it in this particular case is we I created TestWiz as a Uber jar, as a super jar, which includes all other dependencies automatically packaged inside it. That means I now only need to specify TestWiz as a dependency in my framework and all the dependent libraries will be available automatically to me. I don't need any other dependencies. And now in my network configurations, working with your IT teams, network teams, you can make sure as long as this particular dependency can be downloaded, everything else is fine. So you don't have to make n number of changes, just one change in your network rules to allow that download to happen from your CI infrastructure if it is not available already. And that becomes a very easy thing uh, to use then uh, as part of your execution, because now this Uber jar that I have downloaded, it exposes one run task, which I can just provide a set of parameters or configuration files to it, and my test will execute automatically. I don't need to do anything else for it. So this is another technique which can be used if your CI ecosystem is not allowing dependencies to be downloaded dynamically at every time, then you can use this approach for that or to solve that challenge. The next challenge is about, you've got your CI ecosystem set up. Now you need to run the test. To run the test, if this is against a web application, you need browsers. But the browsers are not available in your CI ecosystem on the CI agents. So how will you proceed over there? So the next solution is to use browsers in Docker containers on your CI agent itself. This makes it very easy because you might have a huge pool of CI agents and you don't need to install browsers in each of them and maintain browser versions as well for that matter. If you are running this as a Docker uh, container, then you will be able to get the exact version that you want for the architecture uh, that is available on in your CI ecosystem, whether it's Linux or Windows or anything, it does not matter. Your Docker image can fetch the, the Docker script can, can fetch the right image and have a browser available to you based on that. This script that I implemented supports any architecture. I could run it on Windows, Linux, Mac, Mac, Intel, Mac, uh, M1 uh, processors or anything. And you can specify which browser, uh, which version you want, and you'll be able to download it and use it automatically. The script, when it starts the containers, also starts it in a specific namespace, a unique namespace every time, so that if you're running your tests in parallel, multiple instances of tests are running, the images will not conflict with each other. Also, Docker images might also need proxy information. The script can support that as well. So these scripts, which can be executed on local or in CI infrastructure, it is available uh, in my GitHub. You can look at it. The links are available uh, over here. <clears throat> you can look at uh, these scripts in the TestWiz repo. 
uh, where you'll be able to see how to download it and how to start those containers in a very easy and seamless fashion. The next solution. Now I have my test that can be run. Setup is done, browsers are available. If I'm not using browsers, I'm, I'm using device farms, then it's no problem. My agent setup is ready to run the test. How do I run the test? Now, Azure has this concept of build pipeline and release pipelines. Different CI tools have similar concept in different ways. So this is not about Azure, though the examples are using Azure. It can be applied very easily to any CI tool. So in case of Azure, for example, I have a build pipeline where any code change that has happened to the front end and back end code, we are going to run a bunch of tests in the pipeline first before we uh, merge to master. And uh, this particular pipeline is going to create the artifact. We want to run the test, the system test, end-to-end -end test, or the API test as well as part of this pipeline against this artifact that is being generated to make sure everything is fine before the artifact is published for use in further environments. So in the build pipeline, that is one place where we would want to run the test. How does that happen in case of Azure? So in Azure, you can create a pipeline using manual configurations, or you can create a YAML file uh, where you can you, uh, set up your configuration, which can be reused very easily across different branches, devices, or teams as well. You can also create templates out of those pipeline uh, files and use those across different projects as well, because these templates are about a common way of running specific tasks. In case of running system tests, we created these uh, templates for build pipelines, and we are able to reuse these with appropriate configuration parameters or pipeline variables. <laughs> All these steps that have been executed in the pipeline are actually coming in from the pipeline YAML, which would be coming in from a template itself. So if I have to show the template, this is the Azure pipeline template where all the different things that are required, whether I want to fetch a dynamic port to be used for uh, starting the containers, or if I want to set up the proxy to uh, uh, set up specific node versions, I want to install the NPM packages or run the test. All of these different steps are implemented in this template pipeline. And by using the pipeline variables, this same script will run in different fashions based on the values of the variables that are provided to me. So in my build pipeline also now I can execute these tests in a very seamless fashion. And if you're using TestWiz again over here, it's one change of parameter to say I'm running this in CI and I'm going to run these uh, tests against a device farm. It will pick up the correct configuration and run the test over there. So it's a, essentially it's going to be the same command line uh, that is executed to run the test <laughs> as you did on local machine as well. Now, we spoke about the build pipeline. Once the artifact is generated, you want to actually run these tests against different environments when your code is deployed in those environments. And that is where Azure calls it as release pipelines. So in this case, once the artifact is generated, I want to deploy my artifact in an environment and then run the tests over there. So in a release pipeline, you have a concept of task groups, which is similar to, but again, slightly different than a build pipeline template. But you create a task group, which is again, a reusable component, a reusable asset of how to execute a certain test uh, set of tasks. You can include a specific task group for your system test or API test. And configure it with the correct uh, variables, the same test which ran on local will now run in build pipeline as well as in your release pipeline, depending on where this task group has been called. So this is how a task group configuration looks like. You will have various different steps over there, which are configured, and it is going to have specific values. You will be able to do assertions on those as well. If certain uh, uh, mandatory parameters are not provided, you can just stop the execution over there. All of that can be done very easily in task groups. When you have your task group created, 
you will be able to configure these task groups in various different stages of your pipeline and uh, have the test execute accordingly. This way, you do not have to repeat the configuration across your release pipelines. And more importantly as well, as your test execution approach in, uh, changes or evolves, you simply go and update the task group automatically. All the pipelines using that task group will be able to uh, will get the change automatically. You don't have to do that manually anymore. So that again becomes a very valuable way of running the test in the release pipeline. And for each stage of your pipeline, all the values that you need to have, all the uh, variables you need to provide, you'll be able to provide the value for each of the stage over there, and you'll be able to run the test accordingly. And that is why it is very important, again, reiterating the fact your automation framework needs to be very configurable. And simply by providing the values from uh, here as a variable, the framework should be able to use those values and run the test accordingly. Okay, So this was about release pipelines. <clears throat> now, we've configured the tests. We've implemented it. We configured it in our CI pipelines. We ran it in the build pipeline, release pipeline. Now is the time to actually make your test valuable. What does that mean? Automated, we do test automation because it should give us fast feedback on the quality of our product. Second, it should reduce the manual testing effort. I don't want to repeat the same test activity manually every time. I need to automate it. If your tests are not set up as a hard gate, that means you do not care enough about your automation and you are inherently, you are inevitably going to rely on manual testing. You should be able to stop your build if there is any test failure. But easier said than done. End-to-end -end test is very challenging. Plus, even if it is not end-to-end -end test or any type of automated test for that matter, tests will fail. That is the nature of uh, that's why we are doing automation, right? Test should fail if there is a problem. And the test can fail because of a product bug or it could be a test implementation issue as well. So now you are in a situation where you have some tests that pass consistently, some tests which are failing consistently and failing for the right reason, product issue or a test issue. How do you set up a hard gate if there are test failures? And that's a problem because these are known test failures. The fix will come tomorrow or a week, whenever, right? Based on prioritization or the time it takes to fix it. And that is where this hard gate concept is uh, slightly different. And uh, to me, at least it is very interesting. So you want to take quick decisions. And for every test execution cycle, you want to ensure the tests which are supposed to pass every time continue to pass. Out of 100 tests, five are failing for either product or test issues, but 95 are supposed to pass every single time. Whenever you run the test, that's what should happen. 95 tests should pass. The second part is the unique thing over here. I know five tests are failing. Till the fix is there in place, I expect all the five tests to keep failing. Those five tests should keep failing till the product bug is fixed or the test is fixed or updated to resolve that issue. But this is what is determinism in automation. Out of 195 should pass every time and five should fail every time. And it's the same five should fail every time, not any random five, right? It is not about percentage, it's about the exact test. Is it supposed to pass or fail? If this criteria is not met, the build should fail. So to make your test valuable, we need to ensure the hard gate criteria is met. The build fails if one or more passing tests have failed or one or more failing tests have passed. If either of this criteria changes, the build fails. 
Now, this can become a big problem for teams because now you need to put in a lot of effort to make sure there is consistency and determinism in your test execution cycle. But if you have this, your tests are valuable. It is telling you exactly what is happening in your product and for the quality of the product. Now, TestWiz supports the hard gate uh, functionality. It's a simple flag that you would provide and an annotation that you would add on your tests. <coughs> With this approach, you will be automatically be able to run your passing tests and failing tests in the build pipelines, release pipelines, and only when all of these pass, your build is going to be successful. I hope this is something that everyone thinks about very uh, consciously, and uh, I would love to hear from you. What do you think about this hard gate concept? But this is something that is implemented and it is adding a lot of value and causing a lot of pain to the team because now the build cannot proceed if there is any unknown issue that is happening in your test execution cycle. And only with this approach, your manual testing can remove the same tests that have already been automated. You don't need to repeat the same thing. So this was about the execution side of solutioning. There are some other solutions also that are very valuable to streamline your end-to-end -end automation. And this is again something that has been implemented in various different places. I've implemented it in various different places. The first one is using visual assertions. Using AI for visual assertions is going to reduce significant amount of code uh, that you need to write for implementing the test. It also means reduction in code means reduction in a need for locators which makes your test automatically much more stable as well. And by reducing code, by reducing the number of locators that are required, you are still going to get the full screen coverage uh, that you would not be able to do as part of a standard automation. So AI can add a lot of value in your test automation if used in the correct fashion at the right place. Don't use it just for the sake of using it. It has to add value. So uh, this particular solution worked great for this uh, client because they're able to use it across all different types of uh, applications, Android, iOS, web, desktop, Electron, and also using the UltraFast grid, they're able to scale across all different browser validations as well. The last solution that I want to talk about is a central reporting server. This is again something which is not thought of very consciously by teams. And I would strongly encourage you to look at tools like Report Portal. Report Portal is one of the tools. There could be there would be many others similar uh, fashion that can provide a, uh, give you AI capabilities and AI ML capabilities for your automation results. So you can set it up as a central reporting server, which all your teams can use. And the best part is you can see real time progress of executions happening. You'll be able to see links uh, uh, to your you can embed links to your device farms or whichever uh, place where your reports are. You can add, attach uh, artifacts like log files or device logs over here to make it more meaningful when you look at the results. Screenshots are available out of the box. That gives you more insights into the execution. You can add your visual testing results over there as well. So one place to see all the information about your test execution. But this is standard reporting. What you get additional capabilities is uh, these things, the trend analysis, which is very important. How flaky is this test? How often does it pass or fail? You'll get it out of the box. That's very important uh, information. You can classify the defects in various different ways, which is customizable to you. And you'll be able to understand why the tests have failed. What are the reasons for those failures? That becomes very important as well. And to add to that value add with the AI ML capability of report portal, you will be able to do auto analysis of the failed results which means once you take a decision on the results, uh, that is the, the failed results, you'll uh, report portal will automatically classify those failing tests for you if a similar match uh, decision was taken earlier. So you don't need to do this result analysis every time, or rather you need to focus only on the new types of failures and not the old ones, uh, because report portal will automatically classify what type of issues uh, were there in your execution. So auto analysis is extremely helpful. Plus you can create very interesting dashboards and uh, using the different widgets that are there to help take 
easy decisions on your tests. Now, report portal integration uh, can happen. Uh, they've got a lot of different integration with different frameworks. TestWiz, Karate, they have integration with report portal automatically. But let's say if you're using an automation tool or a framework which does not have report portal integration, as long as you're able to generate J unit results, you can use this particular script that I have written, which can upload those results to report portal for you, and you'll get the same capability as you saw earlier. So that can become a very easy way for you to integrate a report portal in your test execution without making any code changes. Just by using the J unit results of your execution, you'll be able to see the results over there. Uh, these J unit results could be for unit tests, contract tests, API tests, end-to-end -end tests, performance tests, security tests, any different types of automation that you are doing. As long as J unit test results are created, are generated, you can send it to report portal from here. Okay. So to summarize, I've been on a spree over here. End-to-end -end test automation has a lot of challenges. These are the challenges that I faced. And these were the 12 solutions that I came up with. I implemented along with the team to reduce the pain of these challenges and get determinism from our automation, make automation valuable. Most of these solutions that I shared are already available on GitHub. If you need more information, please do reach out to me and I'll be happy to discuss more with you and share these solutions, help you implement the similar solutions in your organization as well. Thank you very much for your time. I don't know how much time we have for questions, but I'll definitely be available on Hangouts as well. So please, uh, let's continue the conversations over there. Thank you so much, Anand. It was really delightful. Thank you, everyone.